So the Biden administration does it again. And they're proposing a 30% tax on all crypto mining. Welcome to America as we stumble everything and allow the other countries to catch up. So we're going to take a look at uh, what's going on with the almighty Biden administration at 30% tax. Also, we'll take a quick look at the tax rate hikes from a uh, friend of the show, uh, Jerome Powell. And then also, we're going to take a look at just some quick things that are going on with the banks. So before we get into it, we all know that today is Jerome Powell Day where he's going to come out and he's going to say essentially that he's going to raise rates. Now, I don't know why this is a mystery to anybody, but uh, apparently this is big news. So this is the CME group and it is their watch. And the FOMC meeting is in uh, roughly an hour or so. Everybody's going to do live streams. Everybody's going to talk about it. I just don't see the point because he's going to raise the rates again. And it's amazing to me. This is the target rate probabilities for the 30 May, which is today. And if we take a look at that uh, for, the, for the percentage that some people think that right now we're looking at between uh, 4.75 and 500 for the rates. And people believe, 13% of people believe that Jerome Powell will keep it at the same rate. And uh, I don't know who those people are, but I'd like to meet them and talk to them and, and understand why they're, why they're saying that. But we're looking at 86%, almost 90% of people going, yes, he's going to raise rates because that's what Jerome Powell is doing. He wants to hit that inflation rate between two, around 2%, I think he's seen 3%. And uh, he said very clearly, that is our job, higher for longer. And what is interesting to me, though, uh, for just these Fed rate hikes, is that just a month ago, on 3rd of April, you had, it was almost a 50-50 split. You had 42% of people thinking that it would stay at the current rate. Almost 50% thought that. And 57% said, nah, 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 we think it's going to actually go up. Almost a 50-50 split. Now, with all the bank collapses and things that are going on, people kind of uh, wised up. But to me, I just don't see it. So how do you play this? Well, I can't give you financial advice, but me personally, I still believe once this rate hike comes out, people are going to come up and say, oh my God, I can't believe you raised the rates and we're going to have a little bit of a dip in the market. Although I don't understand why. People say this is priced in. There may be a little bit of dip. Maybe if you want to weigh a little bit around uh, for your DCA buys, you can do that. Again, that's what I'm doing. Just waiting to see when the, the, the rates come out and he officially says it, but I could be wrong. So that's what we have for the rate hikes. Not really concerned about that one. What I'm concerned about is this, the damn tax. The damn tax from the Joe Biden, Joe Biden administration, president here in the United States, until potentially 2024 when we have a presidential election, and I think he'll be ousted. But who knows? I could be wrong. So this is not a political channel. I know people hate when I talk about that, but I got to tell you, uh, the Biden administration so far has been a catastrophe for crypto and digital assets. And people will always say, what about uh, Donald Trump? Uh, wasn't he pretty bad for crypto? Well, he wasn't great. But he's not been the president for a while, so I don't know why we talk about him. Right now, this is the administration. This is what we got. So there's a new pro a proposal in this year's budget. The DAM tax, Digital Asset Mining Energy Excise Tax, or DAME, if you want to say it that way. So the firms would face a tax equal to 30% of the cost of the electricity they use in crypto mining. While crypto assets are virtual, the energy consumption tied their Computationally, computationally intensive production is very real and imposes very real costs. Well, this is very true. I think everything uses electricity. Am I wrong? I mean, if we want to mine gold or if we want to put on uh, electricity for, throughout the houses or if we want to run the banks or if we want to run the long institutions, we pay for electricity. That's the free market. If we want to use the electricity, we use the electricity and we pay for that electricity. So then it goes on and talks about, of course, the, the same song and dance of how much uh, electricity it actually uses. And it states high energy consumption has negative spillovers on the environment, quality of life, and electricity grids where these firms locate across the country. I don't want to go into this in detail. We talk about this enough on the channel. But again, this is just data points, which if you're just going to bring out these data points and talk about it, the narrative can force people to look at crypto in a very negative light. Because they go, wow, we're wasting all this energy in just this 
this mining operation, which is the virtual good. We don't understand. However, people don't understand that, you know, a lot of this electricity that we're using are renewable resources. That could be wind, solar, and nuclear. They're also being used for energy sources like uh, burn off of gas, which is uh, actually damaging to the environment. Bitcoin miners are able to, to capture that and use that hydroelectric power and so on and so forth. And when we talk about the electrical grid, again, here in Texas, uh, we've got the mining operation Riot. When they use excessive energy to run the Bitcoin miners, the electrical power grid here in Texas go, look, we're having a strain because you guys shut off. We'll pay you to shut off. And they do it. So when we talk about these things, it's the same thing. And to me, it's just it's a it's a great example of if you just want to use one narrative piece or one data points, you can manipulate a lot of people in a lot of lot of ways. And it, and I'll be honest with you, it's the same thing here in, in the crypto markets. If I want to manipulate and just talk about one data point, uh, it's easy to manipulate people. I hate to say that, but it's true. Unless you get all the data points and all the information. It just is irrelevant in my personal opinion. So that is what we have. And then it goes on. And the last part here is the primary goal of the damn tax, damn, is to start having crypto miners pay their fair share of the costs imposed on local communities and the environment. Again, uh, there was a great piece put out uh, uh, where they took a look at uh, uh, riot blockchain and they went down there and they and they interviewed people and interviewed the uh, effects that it has in the community and actually it was a job creation and it's a reason why i think here in texas you got senator ted cruz who is really all about it and he says this is great for the community this is great for everything that goes along so he is a support of it i just don't understand what the problem is but i could be a little bit off so let me just think about that in the comments section but then speaking of uh hypocrisy I just want to throw this in real quick. Uh, there is a new bill, bipartisan. One is a Democrat, one's a Republican, Matt Gates and uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Ocasio -Cortez. They introduced a bipartisan bill to ban Congress members from trading and owning stocks. I got to tell you, that's a step in the right direction. But if you just do a Google search of uh, bills to ban Congress from trading stocks, it goes back over 30 years, and they never, ever pass them. There is one, the Bill Act, or the Stock Act, where they pretty much just give you a slap on the wrist, and even though you can make millions and millions of dollars, and they'll just fine you for tens of dollars. But I found this very interesting. This is from Benzinga, the 10 best stock traders in Congress in 2022. And we always make fun of Nancy Pelosi, but she is number one. I, thought, I found this fascinating of just how good Congress people are. And if you think about it, if we talk about insider trading, if you're sitting on, oh, I don't know, a committee where you can meet with the financial regulations and, uh, and banks and figure out what's going on in the, in the macro environment, take that information and, and, uh, and sell and buy stocks, it might be pretty beneficial to you. I don't know if that happens. I don't want to be sued, but it seems like that's what it is. And there was a report just out at the beginning of the year that found that House Republicans had more than 1,000 fewer trades in 2022. House Democrats had over 1,000. So Democrats were trading more, Republicans trading less. Democrats saw an average return of negative 1%. Republicans saw an average return of 0.4%. So sometimes it's not about all the trades you do. It's just making the good trades. But just so you know, they both beat the negative 18% return on the S&P 500 in 2022. Over the past 10 years, 10% of fund managers outperformed the S&P 500. 10%? I don't understand why people use fund managers. Throw in an S&P 500, probably do better. And 5% of the total Congress outperformed. So 131 of the possible 535, 26 beat the market, which equates to 20%. So you got 10% of fund managers can outperform the S&P 500 and 20% of Congress can do it. And here's the top offenders or top great traders. Uh, I don't know if you know these people. Uh, Patrick Fallon, Republican, he's up 51% as far as 2022. Good job. Debbie Schultz, Democrat, 50%. Susie Lee, David Joyce, Republican, Democrat. So don't sit here and be all high and mighty if you're a Republican or if you're a Democrat. They're all mixed in there. Just like... All models are wrong and some are useful. All politicians are wrong and some are useful. And then ranking outside the top 10 and also failing to beat the market was former Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi. 
between herself and her husband, Pelosi, at a return of negative 19.8% in 2022. So I think you should pretty good in 2021, but it's just something to take the bank, just so you know. So that's a little uh, update for the hypocrisy in Congress. Now let's get to a little piece of the banks. Now, yesterday we talked about how we are ahead of the game. We are ahead of taking a look at the four-year cycles as far as 2019 year versus 2023 year. And of course, in the next year, in 2024, we're going to have our Bitcoin halving. That, I think, is the kickoff. But you got to understand, that's going to happen in a year. So right now, from here until the Bitcoin halving, until potentially another, another big uh, massive run-up in 2025, it's going to be pretty volatile. And the things that I see that are a problem are banks. This is uh, Joe Consorti, Michael, Mark Analyst of the Bitcoin Layer. He says, all banks are sitting on major securities losses. And before, some people will talk about the regional banks, but the big four U.S. banks have a combined $211 billion in unrealized losses. And Bank of America is about 33% of that. Regionals are getting slaughtered due to their small deposit bases, but large banks have these holes too. And it's very interesting because we have these banks, then you have the regional banks. This is from Rezo. And as far as their prices, stock prices, PacWest is down 30%, potentially the next one to fall under. Western Alliance, Metro Bank, 21%. Home Street, 15 Zions, 10 Key Corp, 7%. So if these start to collapse, then the big four start to pick those up. I'm sure Jamie Dimon has no problems with picking up smaller banks. And before you know it, now we just got like four banks that everybody's going to be using. So I don't know how this can be not a concentration of power, but it seems like things are going that way. And then just so you know, because some people would talk about, well, just these, these four small banks are, are, are uh, taking a big loss. But the CIO, the chief investment officer of JP Morgan Asset Management said, it'd be naive to say that this is just limited to First Republic. So what I'm talking about here, these problems is also leading to these problems. And why I think this is going to be a bigger problem is because the greatest inverse play of all time, Jim Cramer said the collapse of First Republic Bank could mark the end of the banking crisis. And if Jim Cramer says it, it's going to happen, do the exact opposite. So there is that. And I think I see some big problems. And on top of that, just to kick this off or leave this with you for something to think about. Again, yesterday we talked about the Bitcoin having April 2024. We saw it on May 11th in 2020. Between now of May 3rd to April, we're looking at a year. And in that time, we could see some pretty big swings. And I just want to remind everybody that on April 19th, 2008, before the Great Recession came up, Federal Reserve Chair Ben Bernanke came out and said, you know what? the U.S. could face a mild recession. And of course, we know what happened in 2008, 2009, and it took us a while to recover. And guess who said that recently? Well, friend of the show, Jerome Powell. It could be a mild recession. I don't think any government employee in power has ever said, we're going to see a major recession. Brace yourself. It's going to be awful. It's always mild. So this could be, but as a quick reminder, recessions don't last forever. Bull markets don't last forever. On average, a recession lasts 10 and a half months. Of course, the Great Recession was a little bit longer. But what does that mean? That means if we take a look at time frames, this all lines up to 2024 and 2025. I could be wrong. That's where I see things going. And lastly, before we get into a little chat, a little Q&A, this is a quick reminder. Uh, me, Ben, and Guy will be going at it tomorrow. Uh, NFA Live, that is 6 Pacific, 6 a.m. Pacific, uh, 9 a.m. Eastern Time. And we're going to talk about a litany of things. The debt ceiling, uh, Pepe, which uh, I think is still in the top 100. Talk about regulations and our biggest losses in crypto and how we screwed up and how, where we're going from there. And that's it. So look, that concludes today for the news. If you like today's video, give it a thumbs up. Consider subscribing. This is not a set it and forget it type of play, in my personal opinion. So why don't you subscribe and uh, we'll do these videos daily. Now, I don't usually do live streams. This is just a special day. 
as it were. Sometimes I do these on Saturdays or Sundays, but uh, I'm taking off for Los Angeles this afternoon. So I want to get things rolling, get out before that. But that's it for today. Thanks so much for stopping by. If you want to stop uh, or stick around, we're going to do a little chat and I'll answer some questions to the best of my abilities. And we'll go from there. So thanks so much for stopping in. All right. <laughs> Everybody's here. Hey, Dan fam. Beardy, Rusty Bot, Mad Cow. Crypto Golfer. Irrational. Jupiter Mojo. Rusty Bot. Everybody's here. Matthew Smead is here. And Dr. Payne is here. Yeah. Dr. Payne says it right. Don't be confused. It's not a Democrat versus Republican issue regarding crypto. Uh, Steve Mnuchin was Republican, didn't support crypto under Trump. Exactly. So Democrat, Republican, uh, hopefully we get somebody in who's uh, a little bit more crypto friendly, but who knows? Mm, can we talk about the halving of Litecoin coming up in 48 days, please? Yeah, you know who's big on that is Tom Crown. Uh, check out his channel, if you, especially if you like trading. He does a lot of that. I think he's going to have a live stream. So with that one, I hope everybody does really well with Litecoin. I own zero. But uh, there's only like 10,000 cryptos out there. Can't hold them all. Mm, yeah. So, you know, going back to this one, the damn tax. This is a bad idea, just in general, because here's what can happen. It's very simple. If you tax somebody enough, uh, two things will happen here. One, the crypto miners and the crypto operations and, or the Bitcoin miners and, and, and all the mining operations will say, you know what, we're done with this and we're out of here. And they'll just go across to a crypto-friendly environment that wants them to be there. Did you know that Russia is subsidizing their Bitcoin miners by paying them and also uh, having them drastic reductions in electricity. I'm not saying people are going to move to Russia. What am I saying? You can move to a lot of different places because it looks like America doesn't want it. So there's that. And the second thing that could potentially happen is this. If you're going to tax Bitcoin miners, that makes them unprofitable. The ones that can't be around, they'll say, well, too much of a tax, so we're out of here. And what will happen is the bigger industries will just take over and then we'll have one or two Bitcoin mining plants and that'll be it. And that's it. And then you'll just have one or two and everybody will plug into that. Now, Bitcoin miners can go across the globe. I understand that. But as far as like here in America, you'll just have, you know, maybe a couple of them and then the rest will just go away. And that's it. But yes, Bitcoin miners, they can plug into any Bitcoin mining operation they want to. That is true. And no, I'm not a Bitcoin miner. That's a very tough business. I would not, me personally, I'm not doing that. What you doing in LA? I'm going to see my son who was in a little accident. Cracked his, his uh, tibia right in half. So, listening but guarding, that's very uh, good. Robert Gauss is here. What time is the FOBC meeting? Let's take a look. I think it's in roughly an hour. It is in 51 minutes. So don't worry. There is a, a ton of people who are going to be live streaming that. But I don't, I mean, look. Look, 